The utter failure of honest and open dialogue by authority figures last year and so far this year in 2022, and the disrespect for evidence has led to a terminal breakdown in confidence in vital public institutions, elected officials, and of course, experts. If you just want to know what's happening in any domain, from cars to COVID or even Kylie or Novax, Jocko Itch, this is probably the worst thing about living in the modern world. Or to put this another way, more simply, we've got fuckwits in charge and we are drowning in a sea of bullshit. That's next. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap <laughs> for buyers here in Australia. Website for that, obviously. Or you can simply click the card that may appear up there now, dude. Except, of course, if it doesn't. Fair warning on this one, right? This report is not about cars, not even a little bit, so... Dude, don't bother bleating about it in the comments. I won't care. Just click away. Don't watch. You're welcome. I'm departing from cars today because Sydney, the biggest city in Shitsville, whence I live, again, resembles a freaking ghost town. <laughs> People are scared and stressed, apparently, and the media is just not helping. Testing for COVID has essentially collapsed. The health system is teetering, that's pretty clear. The supermarkets are emptying also. But aside from that, I suppose, all good. It's abundantly clear that Scott Morrison's handling of the pandemic is, in fact, the worst public policy failure in Australian history. At least, that's how it seems to me. It seems to be objectively clear. I think you could mount a compelling argument to prosecute that. Certainly, this is true in my lifetime, and I suspect also in living memory. And just 12 months ago, let us flash back, okay? Let's be kind. The uh, giggling coal industry stooge in charge of our formerly great nation made us a laughing stock on the world stage again, still, by telling the Sydney Morning Herald that it would be, quote, dangerous to rush a coronavirus vaccination rollout, unquote. The headline that accompanied that story was, quote, vaccine can wait, says PM. Finger on the pulse there, sir. Two months later, of course, he uttered the prophetic words which tell me unequivocally more even than walking into Parliament House with his lips pursed around a nice lump of coal, or forcing that hapless, exhausted firefighter to shake his friggin' hand, remember that. This event tells me how preposterously out of touch with science Coal Humper 6 really is. That's when he said of vaccination, quote, it's not a race. Now, pretty clearly, it was a fucking race, sir, and it still is. He had two jobs, essentially, right? Quarantine and the procurement of a vaccine for the population. Both utterly botched. This pandemic is the number one security threat to this country. And if handling it were a primary school assignment and you were the teacher, you'd be calling in the parents and explaining, as diplomatically as possible, that Scotty might in fact benefit from some special needs education. It's pretty clear that Omicron is out of control. Like, I'm not a virologist, but I did study a lot of applied mathematics and science at university, mainly physics. And you can clearly see that they just don't know how many cases there are currently because the testing capacity has been overwhelmed. It's exponential growth, right? And we are on the really steep bit of the curve, but clearly they cannot acquire meaningful data about the number of infections from this point forward. New South Wales neocon nutbag Premier Dommy Parrothead gave us about a week of comparative freedom back in December, remember that? Under his fatally flawed let it rip strategy. <laughs> yes. And he repealed that about you know, six or seven days thereafter. Well done, 
you dickhead. I'm sure many people said that, or words to that effect, down at the pub that next Friday evening, incidentally. I went to the friggin' supermarket on December the 28th of last year, and I QR-coded myself in like a good boy, which is actually a very George Orwell process when you think about it, albeit completely normalised today. Now, this building is 3,000 odd square metres, okay? And I was in there for about 15 minutes filling the ute with bog roll, like everyone else, again. Actually, I think I was probably just there buying dinner. Three days later, Happy New Year, Jono, I get this red flag, right, from the bullshit Service New South Wales app. And it tells me that I have been in contact with the COVID case and that I should therefore monitor for symptoms and get a test if I develop any. That's factually untrue up front. Being in the same 3,000 square metre building is not the same thing as contact. Like, I, I thought about that day a lot and I don't remember sticking my tongue down anybody's throat or breathing on them or even being in relatively close proximity, right? So, monitor for symptoms and getting a test if you have any. Jesus, dudes, that's the default advice given to everyone in society. So what exactly is the point of this endless fucking signing in to see how empty the shelves are, right? Why are we actually doing it? And good luck getting a test unless queuing for hours on end appeals or paying Jerry Harvey a trillion dollars or something for a rat test because <sighs> Cole Humper 6 refuses to make them free. Like it's only a national security crisis, right? Got to look after our mates. These fuckwits have had two years to get ready for exactly this event, just saying, and virtually unlimited funds to get this right. And yet, here we are. It is impossible to see this pandemic as anything other than a national security threat, like top-down view. Tiffany's suggestion, incidentally, she knows all about that, the top-down view. I agreed. It's impossible to see the response at federal and state level as anything other than a comprehensive failure of public policy. And yet you, statistically, and I, we've done everything asked of us. We've signed in, we've worn masks, we've stayed home, we've gotten ourselves vaxxed. Some of us have sacrificed their businesses, some people their mental health. Well done, middle Australia. Shame on them, I'd suggest. On January the 7th, Parrothead's thought bubble restriction of the day was to ban singing and dancing in hospitality venues. Except weddings, of course, because obviously the virus respects the sanctity of marriage and would therefore, under the, I don't know, Geneva Convention for Pathogens, recuse itself from jumping down anyone's throat at an actual wedding. Possibly also because God has always been so very interested in marriage, apparently. Public events, he said, would continue, however, because clearly the cricket is more important than national or state security or the health of the elderly or any triviality of that nature. Got to go ahead with the cricket, dude. Come on. I defy that clown to reveal the scientific advice which led to these latest impositions. Has singing and dancing in hospitality venues, except weddings, of course, actually been shown to be a salient super-spreading vector for transmission of this virus? Just show us the document, dude. Come on. The current clown, and of course the previous clownette in New South Wales, fail and failed, respectively, to reveal the actual scientific advice concerning any of these restrictions. Well done there. Instilling public confidence in yo bullshit decrees, which seemingly change every day. Today's parrot-based thought bubble is to fine people like you and me for failing to register with the government any positive rat test. $1,000 is what this failure will cost you henceforth. So kind of cheaper than a rat test, if you can find one. Meanwhile, of course, the supermarkets are emptying and the ICU beds are filling up. But thank 
Hazel's H that we have the fines in place. And of course, that you can still sing and dance at a fucking wedding. That's important. No word whatsoever on bolstering supermarket supply chain stability or expanding ICU capacity. It's easy to roll out the army, isn't it? To make sure that everyone is staying home on lockdown, to make sure you're home when you're meant to be. But apparently not for things such as keeping supply chains functional or setting up mobile hospitals, both of which it seems to me are core skills of any decent army. Parrothead keeps parroting his endless reassuring bullshit about the health system's inherent incredible robustness. Now, if I were a doctor or a nurse, I'd be a bit pissed off about that. Actually, I'd be substantially pissed off, considering Parrothead's statements and the obvious relationship of those with the actual facts. If I were Sydney mum Melanie Moyer, I'd be stratospherically pissed off about giving birth to a, quote, gravely ill premature baby on the bathroom floor, unquote, on the 2nd of January this year. According to reports, the baby was not breathing nor moving. <sighs> Imagine that. It does not get any more serious than that for a mum and a dad, right? Emergency services told Alex Moyer, the dad, that they could not provide an ETA on an ambulance. Words fail me. Like, for practical purposes, the ambulance that you requested because you've been paying tax all your life and society has this reciprocal deal with you being part of it, you've got a contract, it's got a contract with you, but hey, sorry, dude, ambulance not coming. Frankly, this is not sounding like the script written about the biggest city in an advanced Western democracy. It's just not. It's a bit third world for that. Thankfully, Melanie Moyer is a trained midwife. So the couple evac the kid in the family car, right? As you do. Mum's doing CPR on the newborn in the back of the family car. She's just given birth. She's doing CPR on a newborn in a moving fucking car, rushing itself to hospital to save the life of their newborn child. 15 points out of a possible 10, maybe 20. That woman is a fucking legend. Dad's not doing too bad either. They get the kid to the hospital. The midwife's standing by at the door. It's the full code blue crash cart treatment, right? The kid, named Ethan, straight on a ventilator, spends a week in neonatal intensive care, but is miraculously okay against all the odds. Silver lining. That, that couple are dead set heroes. Like, talk about capacity for performance under pressure. Like, Jesus I would want them with me in the aftermath of a helicopter crash in the Kimberley. In the exact opposite way, slow-mo and parrot head would only be gross liabilities in that situation, actually diminishing one's chances of survival, right? Think about that event with the Moyers, right? Next time parrot head bullshits you about the health system's inherent resilience and strength. Incidentally, no criticism of the Ambos is intended here, nor of the frontline medical staff who are legends. I've met several paramedics and emergency docs and nurses, and they're all outstanding. I do not know how they do their job day in and day out. This is about the failure to resource critical services properly because the shot callers are too busy, for example, fellating property developers or wrapping their lips around coal miners. I've never wanted to do either of those things. Now let's talk about the other big failure in this process, right? The media. I've worked in print, on radio and on network TV, so I can tell you that the media has been properly domesticated. They're just a shallow PR service now and they're kind of addicted to clicks. So a story about Kylie's cellulite crisis is probably more important and easier to do than... Mum gives birth to baby in bathroom and health system falls over. Let's run with Kylie, right? The media is so biased, of course, towards sensationalism, conflict and 
laziness. All credibility in the MSM is lost. They used to be a balancing influence on high-level bullshit from corporate influences and political influences, but the use-by date on that has well and truly expired and the prawn heads are in the hubcaps, if you know what I mean. Remember hubcaps. The news is already an inversion of reality, right? For example, most people go home and they live completely mundane lives every night. It's only the people who don't who get a run on the news. Like a man in custody after a woman brutally murdered in Bidwell. Like in the news domain, that's a much better promo than 99.999% of Australians got home safe and sound and fell asleep half pissed on the lounge again. Big difference, right? Guess which story gets a run. News is also preposterously sanitised to the extent that you have no fucking idea sitting at home where the presenters actually stand on any issue which they report. A newsreader is, by definition, merely an empty suit who reads words. Full disclosure, I am reading words now, but at least I wrote them and they're what I actually sincerely think. Here's a hilarious recent example, okay? That is Seven News anchor Mike Amor. Mike's always wanted to be a Thunderbird, couldn't get in, had to fall back on reading the shitty prompter. So often that's the case. And this is Rebecca Madden, seen here almost wearing a dress. The co-hosts of Seven News were embroiled in a recent hot mic studio scandal when someone, presumably a disgruntled employee, like dudes just forming an orderly queue over there on the right, it's not such a happy shop, a disgruntled employee inside the shop leaked a conversation between the pair when they were off air but at the desk, presumably in an ad break or while a package was running. So the mics are hot, okay, but the feed from the hosts was not being broadcast. It was still going into the control room, however. They just kind of fade it down, right? The subject du jour, Novak's Jocko Itch. Pretty popular topic lately. Thunderbird 9, apparently called NVJI, a, quote, asshole, and opined, quote, he's got a bullshit fucking excuse and then fell over his own fucking lies. Nice one, dude. Tell us what you really think. Ms. Madern's Jocko rant was a little more circumspect, I suppose. She merely said that the Serbian ball hitter was a, quote, lying, sneaky asshole. I don't know about you, but if the news was actually like that, my ass would be in front of the friggin' TV every evening at 6pm for the whole hour. It just would. Ratings would skyrocket for the what we really think news bulletin. Contrast that to what the package actually said and you get the picture about the massive disconnect between the official news and prevailing community sentiment, right? Ordinary people watching the news are just watching trickle-down bullshit. And I have to say, when you've actually seen news going together, especially TV news, you could not stomach watching the bulletin. It's a farce. Here's the problem, all right? Bullshit is very useful in limited circumstances, but it's not a way to make society better. Like, it's not the Swiss army knife of societal betterment. As a fundamental building block, it's actually a failure. And it's all these politicians and reporters have. CEOs and businesses, same thing. In the public domain, it's bullshit wall to wall. Bullshit is not a tool you should be able to deploy instead of doing your job. It's just not. Tooling us up to withstand the greatest national security threat in living memory is actually a pretty big job, a pretty important one, and the building the response on bullshit is why this has failed, obviously. Telling us the health system is strong is just not the same thing as making it strong.
right? They're different things. And I don't think at the highest level they appreciate that. I think they're completely blind to it. Likewise, the mainstream media is fucked. It's so out of touch with ordinary people that it's just not funny. Like Frontline is not funny today because that's what the media is. There is a default setting in network news, at least in senior management, that you in the audience are both gullible and stupid. Plus, the media has lost both its teeth and its balls, and it's only capable of massaging official spin, and of course, keeping us vitally updated on Kylie's cellulite and Taronga Zoo's new baby friggin' panda or something. These two things, okay, political bullshit and its succubus over in news, combined leads us, it leads us to a place where we in the public just do not trust authority, which used to be a conspiracy nutbag fringe thing, you know, like fluoride in the water, it's highly neurotoxic kind of thing. But today, this distrust is both mainstream and, I think, understandable. The one great casualty in all of this is science. Experts, you know science, right? The only thing standing between us and going back to the 12th century inside a generation. Science. The thing that got 12 men standing on the moon, which developed chemo and CAT scanners and the Hubble telescope and flight and antimatter containment bottles and, of course, effective vaccines rolled out in record time. Yeah, I am looking forward to the comments on that, you anti-vax nutjobs out there. I know you're out there. Have at it. I don't care. The fact is, vaccines work. These are called facts. Nobody cares what you think about them. Least of all, the facts. Science has been thrown, sadly, under the bus alongside politicians, institutions and the media. It's the worst collateral damage ever and a terrible tragedy in my estimation. Like, anything that you don't feel deep in your gut, it's bullshit, right? At least, that's the lens through which many people perceive the world today. In fact, the solution to this sorry state of affairs, at least in my view, is to compel our leaders to start respecting and acting on the evidence, the expert advice. Give us the background, dudes. Show us that you are following the expert advice. We can take it. Omicron did not catch us by surprise. It just didn't. The first wave of COVID, like, yeah, maybe. But even then, the experts globally were warning for years about pandemic preparedness. And nobody official gave a shit anywhere in the world, seemingly. It's just like bushfires. They're not a surprise when they happen. Being under-equipped is merely a spectacular failure of public policy. But Omicron is definitely not a surprise, right? Omicron is a reasonably foreseeable event. We're in the middle of it now, and the dickheads in charge did fuck all about it for two years. A greater degree of disrespect for the trust we placed in them would be impossible to imagine. And the media has failed categorically to call them out on this. And here we are, participating in a reboot of George Orwell's 1984, only with a clown and a parrot calling the shots. <laughs>